Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, it's like brutal natural selection out there in our backyard, so you're the survivors. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you about my, my topic today is rapid adaptation to changing environments. And the, the idea is that, as I'll show you, evolution can be really fast. And the question is, can it be fast enough to rescue species from our changing environment that we think is driving many to extinction? Can it prevent that extinction by the organisms adapting? And I start with the litany of bad things that we've done to our environment, these massive smog banks, burning the Amazonian rainforest, poaching um, our beautiful megafauna, huge amounts of fisheries bycatch, killing fisheries, um, coral reef degradation, the eutrophication of lakes, these huge islands of trash out in the middle of the, of the oceans, uh, and just devastation of the landscape. Uh, in many places, and every week brings us more examples of this. Um, I read the New York Times, and so that's where I got these, but there, there's everywhere just these sort of depressing news about it, and it's all driven by the fact that humans are having an increasingly huge impact on, on, on our environments, and that's largely because our population sizes are increasing. Humans have had effects on the extinction of species for at least since the Pleistocene, but that's accelerating, not just because our numbers are growing, but because our technology is growing and the, uh, our ability to devastate the environment is increasing. Uh, this has been um, plotted as, as the socioeconomic trends. Here's population size, and I've just circled the ones that have major um, environmental impacts that I can think of. Energy use, fertilizer consumption, construction of large dams, uh, water use. And that translates in what Stefan and colleagues call the Great Acceleration. Uh, so that there are these big changes in socioeconomic trends that translate into effects on the Earth ecosystem uh, with increases in carbon dioxide and methane. That's a big increase in, in global warming, nitrous oxide, stratospheric ozone, surface temperature of the ocean, ocean acidification, marine fish capture, tropical forest loss, and so on. And this all translates to, down in this corner, terrestrial biosphere degradation, which by which these guys mean the percent decrease in mean species abundance. So it's translating for the purposes of this talk into effects on uh, species and species abundance. And that means extinction. It's difficult to tell how many species actually have gone extinct because a lot of species that we don't even know about are probably going extinct or undoubtedly have gone extinct. So E.O. Wilson and colleagues try to project or have worked to project using a mathematical model of how many species might have gone extinct over time based on habitat loss. And this is their curve. And if they're correct, we've already lost since 1800 something like 50,000 species. And this potential huge loss, and it's accelerating, it's not slowing down, uh, has been suggested as the sixth major extinction. So these are the classic extinctions in, in geological time. There's five of them and a number of authors, uh, including this most recent uh, book by Colbert, suggest that there's a sixth extinction that we're just at the start of now and that this is the first one that's actually caused by a single organism, humans in this case, having this huge impact on the environment. Is that, is that figure from that book? Oh, this is a classic figure. You can Google it. Get it way. anywhere? Yeah. But I, actually, that figure is in that book, come to think of it. I, did, I got it off the web because it was electronic. Um, so my question is, what role does or will evolution play in response to this huge um, effect on the environment and the potential species loss? Now, extinction is itself an evolutionary process, but I'm thinking more about what it creates. And so one idea, possibility, is that there will be new species generated through speciation because the environment has changed. and Maybe we'll get new species arising that are able to cope with that uh, changed environment. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Rather, I'm going to think of a much more short-term process, which is evolutionary rescue, as I said. Rescue of existing species before they go extinct because they become adapted to their new environment. And so the question that I want to ask is, what about this idea? Is it possible that species suffering population decline due to altered environment can be rescued? from extinction by rapid evolution. In my talk, I'll say, what is rapid evolution? 
What's the evidence for rapid evolution? Uh, what are the effects of human-caused environmental changes on the rate of evolution? What is evolutionary rescue, both in theory and in some examples in data? And then, are there constraints and consequences of evolutionary rescue? Is it really going to have the potential to save a lot of species? So, this is Darwin birthday, or yesterday was, and Darwin days, and so my first example is one that probably many, maybe all of you are familiar with, but I'm going to go through it because I want to use it again later, but this is a classic example of rapid evolution by studies that Peter and Rosemary Grant and their colleagues and students have done uh, in Galapagos on the medium um, ground finch. And the story is that there's been big swings in rainfall uh, in the Galapagos because of El Nino events. So sometimes there's huge rainfall, sometimes there's major droughts. That's translated into big swings in what species of plants are present, and especially plants that are setting different sizes of seeds. So you get small seeds and then a transition to large seeds and then this big rain event and it transitions back to small seeds. And that change in seed availability uh, translates into fluctuating selection for beak size because birds with um, small beaks are able to pick up small seeds and uh, rather efficiently, but when there's a big seed they're not very good at that, but a big beaked um, ground finch is able to um, crush those big seeds and consume them. And so what the grants have shown is this remarkable change over short periods of time in beak size. So this is the first principal component. So it's a sort of um, amalgamated measure of beak size. But, so the units don't mean a lot here. Um, but you can see that there are these big swings in beak size from relatively large to relatively small back to relatively large. And if you just look at the rate here, just this transition here took five years. So there's a change in beak size, a major adaptive change in beak size that happened in five years, the generation time of these birds is on the order of three to four years. So the change in their, in their characteristic, mean characteristic of the population is on the order, happens on the order of a generation. So the way this works is you have some population with some distribution uh, with smaller beaks and larger beaks. And when there's, um, selection on beak size when uh, the, there's a transition from small seeds to large seeds, the birds that have small bills tend to do rather poorly, and so the whole population shifts. It's not that these guys have gone away completely, they're just much scarcer. These guys are now doing better, so they increase. And so it's a transition in the mean size of beaks in the population. And so I want to make it clear that when I'm talking about rapid evolution, it's trait evolution within a population. It's a genetically based, so these are heritable traits that the grants have measured the genetic basis of beak size. They can show that it's highly heritable. Uh, so it's a change in the average characteristic, but it doesn't require the appearance of a new genotype, either by mutation or by some migration into the system. It's just a shift in the distribution. It doesn't require that any genotype become fixed in the population. It's just that the mean is shifting around, but that's a genetic change in the characteristics of the population. And that's rapid evolution. The second example I want to give you is from my own work from the past when I lived in Rhode Island. Um, and it's the evolution of a life history trait, the seasonal timing of egg dormancy in a common freshwater crustacean. And this is literally evolution in my backyard because when I lived in Rhode Island, my house was like right under the F there. Uh, so I just went down to the, this lake and started studying it because that's what I do. And, and I found this interesting phenomenon. Uh, this is sort of already known. See, I made it winter here. Um, uh, when it's winter, February and March, the lake is frozen and the fish are there, but it's really cold and so they don't do very much. They sort of hang out at the bottom uh, sleeping um, or not swimming around much. But when spring comes and the water warms up, the fish begin to feed and they feed on these copepods. And so they're a strong uh, mortality force on copepods. And these copepods have evolved a really cool strategy to deal with that, which is that they shift to making dormant eggs. So in winter, this is the percent of eggs that hatch immediately. In the winter, they're making eggs that hatch immediately. They, the, the eggs hatch, the immatures come out, they grow up and make adults and make more eggs. And that all goes on under the ice. But then when it warms up and before the fish act, actually become active, the population transitions to making diaposing eggs or dormant eggs. 
And those dormant eggs are dropped to the bottom of the pond, and the fish can't find them there. Uh, and so they survive. The adults are wiped out by fish predation, but their offspring stick around until the following fall when it gets cold again and the fish stop swimming around and then they hatch out. So we have this beautiful adaptation, seasonal adaptation, to the onset of fish predation. And it looks really repeatable from one year to the next, but it turns out that this is really important. This is a variation of about a week from the earliest transition. Each of these lines is a different year. There's about a week difference in the mean transition date from one year to the next in this population. But that turns out to be an evolutionary response. And I could see that because the depth of this pond, which sits up on top of a glacial terminal moraine, um, uh, it's all gravel underneath. And so it fluctuates a lot in water depth. And this was a major drought year. These were more full years. And what that does to the fish population is the fish aren't dying or increasing very much in the pond. But when it dries down like that, it concentrates the fish. So when the pond is really full, the fish are scattered through a really big volume. This is about a um, tenfold decrease in pond volume here because there's not a lot at the bottom of, of a pond. And so the fish are really concentrated down there. And then it refills and they're distributed again. And that means that there's huge fluctuation in the timing and intensity of fish predation from one year to the next. And we can quantify that. I won't go through the details of how we did it. But this is predation risk. And so um, in some years, predation risk is relatively low. In other years, predation risk is relatively high. That's when the pond was, had dried down in 1981. And so predation risk got high. And then the pond refilled again. And predation risk got low because the fish are distributed to a large volume and so on. And that's fluctuating selection from one year to the next on these gobopods. And so now we see changes in the average date at which they switched from making immediately hatching eggs to diapausing eggs, oscillating through time in response to the fish predation. And this is only a difference of eight days, but the population is actually moving back and forth. So this is evolution in my backyard when I lived in Rhode Island, and it was really happening. So it, there's this really interesting phenomenon of rapid evolution that if you study it really hard, you can see it going on around you. Now, you've seen the Galapagos finch example, the Cobalt dormancy example. There's a number of other great examples of rapid evolution. This famous one, the peppered moth, uh, response to soot in the, in the atmosphere from the Industrial Revolution. New England snails responding to uh, crabs, uh, predators. Um, Trinidad guppies responding to their predators. Those are famous examples. But it turns out that there's now a huge number of examples of rapid evolution. And more of them are being published every day. This is not to read, but just to impress you that there are people who have tallied all of these. And they did it back 15 years ago. So there's even more examples now. But these are almost non-overlapping lists published at about the same time of examples of rapid evolution. Hendry and Kinnison, and Kinnison and Hendry, See, this is in case you really want to know who these organisms are. I blew it up again. It's still fuzzy. But Kinnison and Hendry published a distribution of the rates of evolution. And I'm not going to explain, I can later, how, what these units mean. But basically, this is the number of, of measured rates of evolution, 434 separate measured rates in, that took place in 80 generations or less. And some of them are not very fast, and some of them are pretty fast, and some are really fast, and some are really, really fast out here. But there are quite a few that are pretty f rapid rates of evolution. And so it's going on all around us um, in the environment, because the environment is always changing. Now, what I want to say is that if it's changing all around us in our backyards, why aren't we seeing that evolution? If it happens within a year or two, and we live in a house for a decade, I've lived in my house for three decades, why don't I see that more easily? And the answer is because it goes fast, but it doesn't go far. And it doesn't go far because it's always changing directions. It's always flipping back and forth. So bill size in the Galapagos finches goes from large to small to large to small. But on average, it's actually not going very far at all. And the same with the copepods, early diapause, early dormancy, late dormancy, early dormancy, late dormancy, but not going very far at any given time. Can you think of that like a random walk? 
Well, it's not really random unless the environment is changing randomly, right? Because it's responding to a change in the environment, change in rainfall, change in water depth and, and uh, fish population density. And that's not atypical. This is, these are just data on rainfall distributions. These are, I just grabbed these off the web. This is someplace in Ireland. But you can see that average rainfall just fluctuates around between bounds. It doesn't go anywhere in particular, uh, and say for wind speed and say for air temperature down here. And that means that when it reaches an extreme, it reverses direction. And so selection, if these are selection forces, selection is always going back towards the center. That's kind of the definition of an extreme. If it kept on going, that wouldn't be the extreme somewhere up there. Would, but it's bounded. And that's a typical pattern in nature, that the, the nature doesn't go in a particular direction, at least for very long periods of time uh, when we're around. Except, because we're around, everything's changed. The great acceleration is no longer keeping things within a particular bound, but we're driving the environment very strongly in a particular direction, which is driving evolution or some natural selection forces and potentially driving evolution. So lots of people, or several people, have suggested that humans are now a major evolutionary force, not just a major force of extinction, but a major evolutionary force. And this guy, Steve Columbia, will actually be here in late April giving a talk, not in this room, but over in, in Corson Hall, if you want to hear him. He's um, written a couple different uh, works on this. This is a review article in Science, and this is a book that he followed that up with. That humans are the world's greatest evolutionary force, his book, The Evolution Explosion. And in the abstract of this paper, he points out that human population growth and the tech growth of their technology is drastically accelerating evolutionary change in other species. He means other than humans. Well, Kendry and Kinnison who made those big tables of rates of evolution, have broken down their study into those populations that are responding to changes in natural conditions versus those that are responding to changes that humans caused. And this is the rate of the amount of trait change, so it's basically the amount of evolution. And sure enough, responses to human-caused environmental change are larger than responses to sort of natural background rates of evolution. <laughs> natural rates of environmental change. And in another study, Deramo and Kinnison and, and colleagues did this. This is just the number of years over which the rate of change was measured. So somebody measured something 120 years ago and then measured it again. But just look at this axis, because these lines don't have slopes. Uh, and so down here is the amount of trait change in response to a natural change in the environment. Up here is the amount of trait change in response to when humans are predators. So that's the most direct effect that humans have on species. For example, commercial fishing. They're selectively removing the largest fish. That's a very strong selection force on that fish population to reproduce at an earlier age before the, you reach the size at which you're going to be fished out. Uh, and so. Humans as predators, things like commercial fishing or sport hunting or commercial harvesting of forests, uh, all of those are human acting as predators. That's the highest rate of evolution. And then intermediate is other anthropogenetic, anthropogenetic effects. So we're polluting the environment and organisms are responding to that uh, pollution indirectly. So humans really are accelerating the rate of evolution. And the question then is, is that fast enough to rescue them from extinction because the environment is changing dramatically. And the idea with uh, evolutionary rescue is if there's no evolution, then the population will simply decline at some constant fractional rate, say 50% is removed per unit time, and eventually it goes down in this exponential curve to extinction. But if there is evolution, the population may start going down because the unfit individuals are being removed or not doing very well in the population. But eventually, more fit individuals appear, and they're able to grow in that environment. And so you get this evolutionary recovery or evolutionary rescue. The way that works, just to go back to the distribution, is we've got some initial generation that has this kind of distribution. The environment changes, so this is what the new environment looks like. There's selection for the 
uh, population to come over to this group of individuals. So when these poorly fit individuals die, that's when the population is crashing. You're removing a huge fraction of that population. But these guys that are also in the population now are able to take over, and so the population increases again. Does that work? Well, people have tried it in the laboratory. There's a number of nice studies in laboratory populations. This is one with yeast, Saccharomyces, which is the yeast used in making beer and wine and bread. Graham Bell and Andy Gonzalez put those yeast into really high salt concentrations, unnaturally high salt concentrations. And initially, this is a log scale here, so 100 down to 10, the population crashes really quickly. But because it's a large population and these guys have a high mutation rate, eventually salt tolerant genotypes appear in the population and it recovers. So we get this classic U-shaped response of evolutionary rescue. So you can see it at least in the laboratory. And we've seen it in my laboratory where we study these little predators, rotifers that, see there's rotifers, um, <laughs> that eat algae. Uh, this is Chlamydomonas, and what we found is that Chlamydomonas normally grows as isolated single cells, and they're readily consumed by these rotifers. But in the presence of the rotifers, the algae evolve a defense against that, and that is they become clumped, and they are sort of stuck together with a mucilage sheath. And once they get up to eight or ten cells per clump, they're too big for the rotifers to ingest, and they just bounce away from this ciliated corona. And so here are our data. If you take a population that has very few cells per clump or per colony, and you introduce rotifers, uh, then the rotifers can eat the algae. The algae crash and the rotifers grow. But as the rotifers grow and the algae crash, there's strong selection for the defense trait, and so the cells per colony increases. And once they get up around above, above around 8 to 10 cells per clump, then the prey can increase and the rotifers stop growing because they can't get the resource anymore. So here's this classic evolutionary rescue as a direct effect of this introduced predator. So those are two laboratory studies. What about in nature? Well, let's go back to Darwin's finches because now we can sort of dissect what really went on there. There was a transition from a population that was a mix of small and large seeds to large seeds. The birds were not very well adapted to that because they had a small beak size, so they're transitioning to large seeds. So the population crashes, but the bird population involves larger beaks, and once they've evolved larger beaks, the population stops crashing and starts going up again. And then there's that second bout where it transitions from large seeds to small seeds. The population isn't in very good shape because it's got large beaks, and now there's a transition to small seeds, and so the population starts to decline, but there's strong selection for big beaked birds, and so beak size, or small beaked birds, and so small beak size goes down again, and the population recovers. So we get this U-shaped evolution, evolutionary rescue in a natural population. Twice. So this made me think, because I'm feeding birds out on my deck, and I, I, I tend to feed them uh, sunflower seeds, and I wonder what happens if I just start feeding them millet. Uh, I'll get different birds at my feeder, I know that, but aren't I just creating an enormous selection pressure? I mean, I can make this an even bigger selection pressure than the birds on the Galapagos experience. So I could be creating strong selection in my backyard by some arbitrary decision of what Agway happened to have for sale um, that week, because I go with what's cheap. Um, it's an interesting problem. Now the birds in the Galapagos are on an island and they can't get away and the birds in my backyard could go next door, um, I guess. But it's just an interesting thought that we could be manipulating evolution by some decision that we just made for some reason not having to do with thinking about backyard evolution. Maybe like an anthill or something? Something that's less mobile than birds? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's a very common phenomenon if you're trying to kill your ants and you spray them with some insecticide, it's very common to observe that those, they evolve resistance to whatever insecticide you put on them. So how plausible is evolutionary rescue then? Well, it's very likely that it's common in nature. There's not a lot of studies yet to really have looked at, they've, they've shown rapid evolution, but they haven't really looked at it much in the context yet of whether it's evolutionary rescue. It's hard really to project whether 
those finches on the Galapagos would have gone extinct if they hadn't evolved. They were headed, headed downhill, but they might not have gone extinct without evolving, but it didn't look good for them. But there's lots of conditions under which evolutionary rescue will not happen. So it won't happen if the population sizes aren't large enough to avoid chance extinction. So if the population crashes to really low numbers, or it starts at really low numbers, even if there's the potential for evolution, it's down below this critical population size, and it may be that something else goes wrong in the environment. A disease comes that, and gets them, then normally the population would have recovered, but uh, it simply drives them to zero, or some other thing happens that mates simply don't happen to get together that year. So there's a chance of critical, below a critical population size that the, pop, the population simply may go extinct before evolution can take over, even if it would have. And low population size also means that there's few new mutations in the population to generate the variants that would actually be good in the new environment. If you have a very large population, like yeast, then every individual, when it multiplies, can mutate, and so some of them will eventually produce a fit genotype. That's what happened with the yeast. But with a very small population, there's very few individuals to mutate, and so the probability that any one of them will actually survive whatever is driving Siberian tigers extinct, hunters, um, it's unlikely that mutation will occur. So low population size is a place where, where evolutionary rescue is unlikely. Another one is if the new environment is way far away from the initial trait distribution of the existing population. So if the environment changes a lot relative to what variants are there, there simply be no variant that's able to cope with that environment, then the population would have to rely on generation of new variants, and that can take time. One dramatic example of this is, here's the dinosaurs happily uh, doing their thing, and the new environment is asteroid impact, and there weren't any, or very, very many dinosaurs that were, had the genotype to, to uh, survive the outrages of asteroid impact, not only being whacked on the head, but tsunamis and, and destruction of their food resources and so on. So that's a reason for extinction. They couldn't evolve. Some of them did, but a lot of them didn't because they couldn't deal with the new environment. And the last one I want to give you here on this is, is if generation times are really long relative to the rate of environmental change. So, Here's just an example of really long generation time. Douglas firs uh, in an old growth forest have an average generation time of 100 years. That is the time from when a seed is produced to when that seed grows up to a tree big enough to produce seeds of its own is 100 years. And you look at the rate of environmental change. I mean, this is 50 years right here, a huge change in the environment. These guys can't evolve in that time because they haven't even reproduced yet. So there are reasons why we might not get evolutionary rescue, but even with evolutionary rescue, there can be costs to evolution that make it not all rosy, even if you recovered in response to the particular change in the environment. So for every adapted trait, there are trade-offs. And my favorite uh, quote about this is from my good colleague Steve Elner, who said, there are no superorganisms, otherwise the world would be covered with green slime. So there would be some superorganism, and it would probably be green slime. It's photosynthetic, and it covers everything, and nothing else uh, can survive there. Except there is no world covered with green slime, because often green slime is really good food, or it uses up its local nutrients, and so it can't survive there for very long. And so there's a number of different ways in which these trade-offs occur, and I want to go through a couple examples of that for you. Here's one on selective uh, commercial fishing. These guys, um, Henry Horn and, and Rubenstein and Rinsdorf, have, have all pointed out that commercial fisheries are basically large-scale, uncontrolled experiments in life history evolution because they're selectively removing the largest individuals. And here in the North Atlantic cod um, population, the median age at maturity starts out bouncing around, but it's around 10. And from 1920s up to the 1970s, it's dropped to around um, seven and a half median age of maturity. So the population has evolved to mature at an earlier age. That's evolutionary rescue, potentially. Um, 
So why is that bad? Well, I don't know for Atlantic cod, but I can give you an example from uh, sport fishery, the black rockfish in the Pacific Northwest. The same thing happened when fishing started in 1996. The average age of mature feed males was nine and a half years, and within four years it was down to six and a half years because they were selectively removing the oldest individuals. And that's a genetically based change, and it's bad for the fish because what these guys, Berkeley and company, showed is that mothers that are older, say 16, 14, 16 years old, produce larvae, baby fish, that grow quite fast compared with the larvae of mothers that are six years old, where they grow at one-fifth the speed. So these, the larval fish that are produced by young mothers are lame little fish that don't survive very long. This is time to 50% mortality. You know, they don't live, they, they're 50% dead by six days, and these guys last 12 days, which doesn't seem long, but there's a lot of larvae out there. The reason for that is that the fish provision their eggs with an oil globule that's carried over into the larval fish. Large, old mothers put a lot of oil and very rich oil into their eggs, and the larval fish get that provisioning. Young mothers don't put much oil into their eggs, and so the larval fish don't survive very well. So there's an unexpected cost to this evolutionary rescue. The population may not actually do very well because of this um, resulting effect of, of females reproducing at an earlier age. Another example is um, trophy hunting of bighorn sheep. I was hoping Jed was going to be here because he loves this stuff. Um, and I just wanted to know what he thought about it. Anyway, these guys hunt for the, for the um, sheep with the biggest horns, and so we see starting in 1975 that mean horn length has dropped from 70 centimeters down to around 45, 48 centimeters because of selective removal of the animals that are making the biggest horns. And this simply shows that there's a very strong breeding value, very strong uh, genetic component to that drop. Well, it turns out that the number of lambs sired by sheep with different horn lengths varies dramatically. It's the big sheep that produce the most lambs. And small uh, lamb or, uh, sheep with small horns don't produce very many lambs. And if you look at where the population ended up down here at around 48 centimeters, you know, they're producing one or zero um, lambs per sire. Now, it may be that they do better once you've remove the big adults because they're competing, and so they're competing for females, but it's at least an unpredictable change in mating success as a result of this selective removal of trophy hunting. So they've evolved to um, reproduce at a smaller age, but younger age, but they're, it's not clear how well the population will do with that. And the last thing I want to point out is that, uh, go back to Columbia's uh, lecture or paper, uh, that evolutionary rescue, even if it benefits a population, it may benefit populations that we'd really rather went extinct. Things like HIV, so they evolve in response to the treatments that we try to produce. Or the uh, European corn borer evolves defenses against um, the uh, pe uh, pesticides that we apply. Or the white cattail, which evolves responses to uh, the herbicides that we produce. So it's the kind of situation that, that I was mentioning. Evolutionary rescue may not be all, all rosy. And furthermore, it's costing the United States something like, according to Columbia, 33 to $50 billion a year in just the fact that the pests that we're trying to remove are evolving and we're continually fighting to overcome that <laughs> evolution. So what about the idea? We know that evolution is, in fact, frequently rapid that populations do often respond evolutionarily to human-caused environmental change. At least some instances that's been resulted in uh, true evolutionary rescue from extinction. But evolutionary rescue can have these undesirable consequences. So in sympathy with Aladdin's genie, be careful what you wish for. Thanks.
is there any way to project, you know, if you took all if you took all the endangered species in the United States or something, and is there any easy way to project um, the probability of evolutionary rescue? Well, given the sorts of criteria that I said at the end when it won't work, you can sort of work from that end right. and say, you know, well, who are the guys that are all really small? Who right. are the guys that um, that have really long generation time? So you could start to sort of parse organisms into categories, but you'd rapidly run out of, inf of information. Right. And there's just a hell of a lot of microbes in the soil that you wouldn't know anything about. Of course. So, but I think you could, I mean, I don't know that you've learned you a lot. You just take like, I mean, you could just take like history traits and population sizes and Put them in bins, and say, yeah, and put them in bins, right? Yeah. yeah. What's your sense? Predict who's going to be around. Yeah, what's your sense? I mean, charismatic megavertebrates have probably have long generation times. And they have low population. And they have low, low population densities. Right. So that suggests that they're screwed. Right. And, and algae and lakes are going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in between, you know, we can guess. The, the mechanism where the algae start to clump into groups of eight or ten and become too big for the rotifers? How, is that understood? Yeah, what's going on is that the, the algae are dividing in, in, into two and they have a kind of uh, very thin mu mucilage seized around each cell. And when they divide, usually that sheath comes apart and they just float around as separate cells. But what seems to be going on is the mucilage, the, the genotypes that clump, the mucilage gets thicker and it doesn't go away, and so the cells keep dividing, but they get stuck inside this mucilage sheath. And so we get clumps of cells that are 140 cells in a clump. They just don't break apart. But there's a disadvantage to that because they have to get nutrients from the outside, and if they're in this goo, you the nutrients don't, get it. It doesn't diffuse in very well. So when the rotifers go away because they can't get the dependent algae, the algae evolve back to being single cells because those guys are better competitors for limited cycling of clumping. Yeah. Right. My question might be too far because I was just thinking it through. Do you have any insight, first of all, on the population surge in our local finch in our backyards, the northern cardinal? I'm a, a, I am participate in the Labapol's feeder watch program, and not just I, but everybody has noticed that there's been more cardinals than usual. Um, which could be human eating. I don't know. What yeah. what would be different? Do you have you investigated or know about that? There's more cardinals at my feeder too. <laughs> yeah, it went from being like one or two yeah. per day to nine or ten for me. But I, I've noticed people. it but I haven't actually talked to anybody who's who knows anything about it. Yeah, I'm but, just curious. Yeah. And but I, it's a response to something in the environment. Right. And it would be interesting to know what's going on there. And then how do you parse out all the other variables? Like if you've got, there was a decline in predators, natural predators, then, then that could account for the surge in cardinal population. How Rather a change in food resource. Yeah, yeah you, need, you need to collect a lot of data. Yeah. So I mean, in, in plankton populations, I can, I can cal calculate how many eggs a, a, a little rotifer is carrying, and I can calculate what its birth rate should be and therefore how fast the population should be increasing, and I measure how fast it's actually increasing. The difference gives me death rate, so I can ask, is birth rate increasing or death rate decreasing? I could pull that apart, and you could do that with cardinal populations if you had enough data. It keeps ecologists and evolutionary biologists gainfully employed. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you say that cardinals are finches? Yeah. And, and the cardinals are brightly colored, but the, the the Galapagos finches aren't so brightly colored, are they? No, they're pretty dull. Is that is that easily understood? Well, you know, usually bird color is attributed to sexual selection or species identity. You know, one species identifying its own uh, conspecifics. But there's a whole literature on that. But I don't know why the Galapagos finches. What's going on with the Trinidad Guppy? The Trinidad Guppy is a cool story where the 
Um, on the, on the island of Trinidad, there are these streams, and there's waterfalls on the streams, and below the waterfalls, there's a predatory fish called Prenocyclo. The guppies are both above and below the waterfalls. Above the waterfalls, there's no predatory fish. So below the waterfalls, the guppies have evolved defensive traits against the predators. Um, they uh, mature at an earlier stage. They hide a lot more. They're not as uh, heavily pigmented. Above the waterfall, they're more pigmented. They uh, mature at a later age and they're nowhere near as cryptic, they don't hide as much. So there's both behavior and morphological differences between the two, and, and the, one of the key people who's been studying that, David Resnick, um, transferred fish from one site to the other and showed that over a very short period of time, they evolved the trait that made them more fit in the new environment. There's been a whole suite of really great studies. Some of it's done here at, at Cornell in collaboration with Resnick. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how how big of a problem um, do you think rapid evolution is to current you know, conservation practices? I guess and or do you think this is something that would be wise to try to you know, or are conservation efforts trying to harness this sort of thing? And my sense is that evolution is often not really considered. I think it has traditionally not been considered evolution or conservation genetics has typically thought about you know small population sizes and inbreeding and things like that. But in the last decade, there's been a huge movement to start to consider evolutionary rescue in particular as a as an important component of how organisms are responding to what we're doing to them. So I think it's catching on now. It's just but so far it sounds like it's mostly wishful. I think it's, it's, I don't know. From a I wouldn't call it wishful thinking because I think people are <laughs> thinking about it more critically than that. They're wondering about it and whether it's, when it's going to be important, how important it's going to be. I don't think anybody's, you know, the only person I know or the only group I know who said we don't have to worry about environmental change because evolution will rescue everything was the George W. Bush administration. I thought was yeah, right. He was rather skeptical about evolution and ambivalent, but his, but the one place where he thought it was okay was because he didn't have to worry about 